Recently, a devotee friend of mine asked me to make some comments about his situation, which is very similar to many other devotees' situations. He is older, he is past 70 years old, but he still has to go to the flea market on the weekends and struggle to make a couple hundred dollars here and there just so he can maintain himself and pay his rent and have a place to live. And he did not pay into Social Security enough money because he was a devotee for many years of his life and he just didn't have any income coming into the Social Security system. So he has no or hardly any points to get credit from the Social Security. So in other words, he's an old retired person and he's struggling very hard just to manage to maintain body and soul together and there's many other devotees in that situation including even some of the ex-children of ISKCON they are struggling also in some cases or many cases trying to find enough work to get by in the world whereas there's a teeny percentage of devotees let's say the upper one half of one percent <laughs> And they have no problems with their finances. They have a nice residence. They have servants. They have unlimited health care expenses. They have a retirement account. They have travel account. They get new computers every year. And they basically seem to have unlimited resources to maintain their life. And they're living quite nicely. Some of them have bought an apartment in Vrindavan. They've also bought an apartment in Mayapur. And they might have a villa in Europe somewhere. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, they might be living on Venice Beach. They might be living in San Luis Obispo. They might be living in Carpinteria, which is a very expensive real estate area. In other words, they seem to be doing fine. So the half of 1% devotees are doing nicely, materially, and the rest of the devotees are not doing so well materially, or some of them are doing okay, but only because they went out and worked very hard after they were devotees, and they worked a lot to, you know, develop some material situation for themselves, whereas the leaders never seem to have worked at all. All they had to do was sit in a big seat, wear an orange robe, carry a dunda around, and make out that they're big devotees, and they're getting all kinds of material opulence and material facility, whereas many of the other devotees are not. So how did that happen? So it looks to an outside observer also, like the assets of ISKCON were all transferred over to a very, very small elite group of people, and the mass of rank and file do not have or did not have access to those resources. So how did this happen? Unfortunately, there isn't really one major event, you could say, that caused all of this to happen. It just gradually, gradually shifted. All the assets gradually were under the control of a small elite group of people, and the rest of the devotees were disenfranchised. And in many cases, they were exiled and weeded out and removed and banned. Some were beaten. Uh, some were sued. Some were executed. But in general, the rank and file were eliminated from ISKCON gradually by different means and methods. And no one seemed to realize this was happening. It was kind of like the story of the frog who's put into a pot and then gradually the water starts boiling and he just sits there. He doesn't realize the water is boiling. But by the time he realizes the water is boiling, it's too late. He's succumbed to the situation and he can't get out. So ISKCON sort of gradually, gradually sunk into the, what I would call, living guru process after 1978. And when I was ringing the alarm bells at the beginning, people thought I was just completely crazy. These gurus are authorized. This is what Prabhupada wants. He wanted us to worship 11 conditioned souls as if they're as good as God. You shouldn't be challenging that. Who are you? Blah, blah, blah. And so many devotees, most devotees, supported the 1978, what I would call, false guru program. And then the 
false gurus started to initiate the new people as their own followers, and they were no longer Prabhupada's followers. So the new people began to attack the Prabhupada followers as being deviants who weren't accepting the authority of the new gurus, and so they helped purge out the original devotees. So it was just a gradual, gradual purge of people. Slowly, slowly, the Prabhupada devotees were disappearing one by one, by one means or another, and they were being replaced by the followers of the new gurus. So this kind of happened slowly and gradually. But there was another element to all this that a lot of people are now not clearly aware of, but when I was removed, Jai Chirta said, watch your back. So clearly it was a warning. Be careful, you could meet with physical violence. Watch your back. And when I went to Berkeley in 1980, a follower of Hansa Duda kind of pulled me aside and said, hey, be careful around here. If you say Hansa Duda is not Krishna's pure devotee, you could get beaten up. I mean, he just told me flat out. So there was a sub-violent sort of menacing and threatening element going on, but there were instances of people getting actually beaten up and sometimes being disappeared. So <laughs> people were getting the message, be careful. But you could face violence if you challenge these gurus. So in other words, you know, going against these gurus wasn't an easy task at the time. You could be banned, you could be beaten, you could be exiled, you could be in a lot of trouble, you could be banned from going to the temple to see Krishna, all that kind of thing. People told me, oh yeah, they're all bogus, but I don't want to say anything because then I won't be able to go to the temple, I won't be able to see Krishna anymore, this kind of thing. So there was a lot of social pressure and mental pressure and, you know, a sub-violent mood at the same time, putting on pressure to stop people from dissenting. And the new followers of the new gurus were in many cases very fanatical people. So you couldn't really argue with them. They were told, you are an offender, you're envious, you're going against Prabhupada's appointed successors, these people are taking me back to Godhead, and you don't want me to go back to Godhead, <laughs> you know, all that kind of thing. So. That was the mood that was being created at that time, and it was very, very, let's say, scary for dissenters like myself. So while this is going on, meanwhile, the assets of the movement are gradually shifting into the hands of a small group of leaders. They're in control of the properties and the money and the assets. And, for example, the children in the Gurukulas were complaining that they weren't getting enough food, they weren't getting medicine, they weren't getting soap, they weren't getting supplies, they were being provided with rotten, unqualified teachers, because there was no emphasis on funding the school for the children. The funding was going to making very opulent lifestyles for these gurus. They had big feasts being made by many servants, and they had nice cars and a nice residence, and taking care of the children just was not a priority. And uh, one would say it still is not a priority. The big leaders are still living in very opulent situations. And in 1997, for example, the leaders said they were going to put a million dollars towards making a child protection office for ISKCON. So that's 1997. But unfortunately, things just got worse for the children in India at that time. 1997, that's when we were suing them in the U USA. But in India, things were deteriorating and the children were getting mistreated worse in India. So they're going to put a million dollars towards helping the children in 1997. And in the year 2001, followers from the Mayapur enclave where they had these schools were begging for money for shoes for the children. So, so where's your million dollars? <laughs> you know. So... The uh, ISKCON followers of Jai Pataka, they blamed me for making a $100 million expense. I had them sued for $400 million for the child molesting in America. 
I helped the Bangalore lawsuit, allegedly $20 million. I helped the BBT lawsuit, $3 million. And I helped other lawsuits. And so the followers of Jai Pataka complained that I had cost this con $100 million. So look where the money's going. The money is going for lawsuits and things like that, not for maintaining the citizens. So this is where the assets have been going. They've been going to protecting and defending the false gurus. Now, when Hunter Duda was arrested for shooting at occupied buildings in Berkeley, it was estimated that it cost the temple a half a million dollars to keep him out of jail. They had to pay for all the windows he shot out. They had to pay fines and fees. They had to pay court costs, lawyers, all kinds of things. And the temple paid for that. You know, ISKCON paid for that. So ISKCON had just become an operation that was being used or misused by these elite people for their opulent lifestyle and for their legal, you know, protection to keep them in office. Now, one of the questions I get on a regular basis, if there has been allegedly over 1,000 cases of children being molested or abused in ISKCON, maybe as many as 2,000, maybe more. Some victims are telling me it's more than 2,000 victims. So why was almost none of that ever reported to the police or the authorities? Where were the parents? The parents found out their kid was abused, maybe raped, and maybe had anal reconstructive surgery and so on and so forth. But almost 0% of the perps or the leaders was ever charged with a crime. So how did that happen? So I believe a lot of this was fear. The parents feared the repercussions of coming out and being a dissenter and complaining about the situation. You know, if we come out and try to have the leaders held accountable for all this molesting, we will be pariahs, we will be banned, we will be beaten, we will be kicked out, we will be mistreated. We won't be able to go to the temple anymore. We won't see our friends anymore. All this kind of thing. So the leaders had a lot of clout. They not only had their own Gunda enforcement services, they not only had their own legal defense department, they had a lot of social pressure that they could apply to people to make them into pariahs, essentially, if they would complain about anything. So... Same thing I was mentioning before. They just kind of fell off the wayside and eventually it didn't even matter that they couldn't go to the temple. They were just fried and left and discouraged and gone. And then the leaders had full control of the buildings and assets, which is really what they wanted. That was their whole purpose anyway. They just wanted to get everybody out of there so they could have the buildings and they could convert the buildings into a Hindu showing the deity business, which is what ISKCON has become. And the original followers are gone, almost all of them. And the children of the original followers are gone. They boycott ISKCON for the most part. And I know a number of those victims. And they, they said, hey, the same leaders that caused us all this trouble are still in charge now, so we're boycotting ISKCON now. We don't want to go to ISKCON and see the same people that caused us mayhem when we were children. <laughs> so that's good for them. It's good for their business. Now they have an empty building. The original people are gone. The children of the original people are gone. They bring in their Hindu donors and they make the Hindu donors into legal signers on the temple properties. And gradually they're just converting ISKCON into a Hindu business, which is what many of us older devotees think it has become or it has almost become. So if we look at pictures from 1975, where it was 99% probably Caucasian devotees in the temple, and we look at that same temple today and study photos from today, and we will see it as 99% Hindus. So the leaders purged out the Western devotees and the children of the Western devotees and that way, they just had big buildings, which they could fill up with Hindus and get the Hindus to give donations 
and that would support their retirement accounts. And some of them have even said that. I had a friend named Mahashringa, and he went into a, a room with a bunch of big ISKCON leaders, the opulent, fat, and happy cats, <laughs> who are living like Saudi princes, millionaires, jet-set people. And he said, Mahashringa said, don't you know that so many people just hate you guys and they're praying for you to die and we don't like what you have done to ISKCON? And they says, yeah, we know that. But what are we going to do now? Are we going to go drive a taxi? Are you crazy? This is our career. We are in this until we're dead. We have no other source of income. We didn't pay into Social Security. This is it. This is our retirement business. Now, some people might argue that this was not originally their plan. They didn't really think we're going to get rid of all the Western devotees and the children of the Western devotees, and we're going to make it into a Hindu business. Maybe that wasn't their original intent, but it became that out of necessity. Because once you've removed all the Caucasian devotees who are collecting the money and bringing in the income to ISKCON, and they're all gone, you're going to need another source of income. And so naturally, they're going to gravitate to the Hindus. But this also started a long time ago. Many of the big leaders began going more and more to India and Poland and Czechoslovakia and Russia and Ukraine and all these places like that because they burnt out the West. The West was just burnt out. You know, France went bankrupt, England went bankrupt, America was sued for $400 million. They went bankrupt. So the Western zones went bankrupt. Like Austria evidently owes a million dollars in back taxes. The ISKCON society cannot be formed there again unless you pay all these fees and fines. So they bankrupted the West and then fled to other places to, you know, start selling their uh, guru business. <laughs> it's what Sulochan calls a guru business to start selling it somewhere else. Well, what does that do? That leaves all of the original disciples and the children of the original disciples in the lurch. They're out of the, you know, the access to the properties of ISKCON and the assets of ISKCON and all the rest of it. They're just out of the loop. So some of them are living in crummy apartments and they've got a crummy old car and a crummy job and they're just barely making it because they've been deprived of the assets of ISKCON. Probably wanted the children of ISKCON to take over ISKCON and be the current managers of ISKCON now, but they're not. A whole bunch of them are living around the San Francisco area here. They're not participating in ISKCON at all. They're boycotting ISKCON. They don't have a position in ISKCON. One of those children actually took his own life and he left a note saying, I have no position in ISKCON. I have no life in my own religion. And he, t and he took his life here. So... That's basically what has happened. These people were exiled out of the property and out of the assets of ISKCON so the leaders could make a Hindu show bottle business out of the society, which is what it has become. But even three, four years ago, some of the leaders were saying, well, what's going to happen to ISKCON? We're going to hand over all of our properties to Hindu managers. We're going to have a board of managers, which is all Hindu, and we're going to be gone and the temples are just going to be Hindu programs. And that's looking like that's what's going to happen. But Prabhupada was very negative about the Hindus. He says, we should avoid the Hindus. I can't preach to the Hindus because they already know everything. In India, there's an abundance of nothing. In India, the people there are very inclined to worship bogus yogis, swamis, and avatars. Do not make ISKCON into another Hindu center, you know, he said things like that on a regular basis. Do not Hinduize ISKCON. If ISKCON is taken over by the Hindus, it will become a business. <laughs> Just like every other Hindu temple is, in one sense or another, a business. You know, they have weddings, they have car pujas and baby blessings and all these different things. And that is a source of revenue for those temples, and they have these Bhagavat Saptas where they charge people money, and ISKCON has already had some Bhagavat Sapta guys coming around to the ISKCON temples and all the rest of it. And ISKCON in England recently removed the Caucasian 
leaders of one of the temples and they said, we're going to model this after Bhaktivedanta Manor, which is all a Hindu program. And they installed Hindu managers. <laughs> so, so it's going Hindu. There's no question about it because the Hindus are giving them money and the Hindus don't have a lot of discrimination. Uh, some of their people from India have wrote to me and said, oh, you don't understand that gurus fall down and have illicit behavior from time to time because you are a milecha. You are a Western fool. You don't understand the process. Oh, and the process is that the successors to Krishna are falling down into illicit sex with men, women, and children. <laughs> That's the process? I don't think so. But we know that in the West because we worship Jesus. So we're not going to worship debauchees and falling down people over here. It's just not going to work. And so it's going to have to go Hindu because the Western people are not going to accept a guru system where the gurus are falling down into all kinds of degraded and debauchee activity left, right, and center, which goes on with the ISKCON guru circle. Now, they had a big reform, supposedly, in 1986, and what was the reform? Well, they reinstated a person who was having oral sex with taxi drivers in the Holy Dham, and they made that person their Vishnu Pod Acharya again. <laughs> so, wait a minute. Vishnu is God. How can we say some debauchee person is equal in purity with God? It's just not a good idea. And then on top of that, they excommunicated Sulochan, and Sulochan said by doing that, they painted a target on my back, and then he was executed after that. So, that was not a reform, number one. Number two, gurus don't need reform. The whole idea that the guru needs to be reformed is false. If he needs reform, he is not a guru. Anyway, now I have friends who are still trying to defend the, you know, ISKCON ship and say, oh, well, Prabhu, they had a reform. Well, Prabhu, everything's going well. Yeah, are you participating? No. Are your children participating? No. Are your relatives participating? No. Uh, do you go to the temple a lot? Well, no. Just maybe once in a while to a festival. <laughs> okay, well, you are not participating. You are no longer within the financial framework of ISKCON. You have no control over the assets or the management or what happens in ISKCON. So you're out of the loop. Sorry. And that is you know, being done on purpose. You have no say in what happens in ISKCON, so they can go forward with their Hindu Bindu program, which they're doing. But anyway, I just wanted to say this is how ISKCON was stolen from the Prabhupada disciples and the children of the Prabhupada disciples. The Prabhupada disciples and the children of the Prabhupada disciples are, by and large, almost let's say 95% for sure, maybe more, are not participating in ISKCON, have nothing to do with ISKCON. Maybe they go to a festival once in a while, this and that, but they don't have any say or control or utilization of the assets of ISKCON. And that is because it was stolen from them by all kinds of clever tricks. And just recently, I was talking to a devotee who found my website, found my material, and he said he was shocked and startled to find out that some of us were claiming that Prabhupada had been poisoned by nefarious managers while he was still here. But he said the evidence looks very clear that Prabhupada was taken out by these managers. And why do people take out the elderly leader of the family? And in most cases, it is because they want to seize control of the assets that the elderly person has under his control. This is a common thing that happens all the time in the material world. And it happens also with gurus. Gurus are taken out by nefarious disciples so they can utilize the assets of the society. So we believe that is what happened in ISKCON. And if you look at the temples, they're empty. 
And even in 1988, Lokanath Swami said the Iskon temples have become empty ghost towns running on a skeleton crew. So they turned it into a skeleton crew so they could bring in their Hindu weddings and car blessings and uh, make this kind of Hindu cultural hall, which is basically what it has become. And that is a business. And again, Prabhupada said, if the Hindus take over my mission, it will become a business. And that is what Sulotran said in 1986. This is a guru business. So anyway, I hope this helps people understand this issue and how and why ISKCON was hijacked by a small cabal of managers so they could seize the assets of the society. And Prabhupada said the same thing happened in the Gaudiya Math. They took over the assets of the society. And that's all their whole guru thing was all about, seizing the assets. So nowadays there's a number of forums where people are discussing the abusive situation created by these leaders. And the leaders are conspicuous by their absence. You can't find them on these forums. <laughs> for the most part. Maybe Malati or somebody like that might come on once in a while and make a few comments. But I think she even resigned from being a GBC because she doesn't want to be held responsible for what's going on. So there's just no accountability and they have a child protection office that they're underfunding and they're minimizing or they're even eliminating and creating a separate child protection office which basically continues the status quo and doesn't allow justice to take place. So there's really no accountability and that's the way they want it because that preserves the business. It's all about preserving the business and the process of banning, beating, suing, and getting rid of dissenters is still going on. A dissenter was just beaten up a week ago. A couple other dissenters were sued recently. So there's just all kinds of suppression and oppression of anyone who exposes the illicit sex with man, woman, and children guru process. And they buried some deviants in the Holy Dom. They buried a pedophile, they buried a porno swami, and they're burying the enablers of the pedophiles and porno swamis in samadhis in the Holy Dom. And I have friends who live in the Holy Dom and they said they're terrified to speak out. They don't want to say anything about these bogus samadhis because they're afraid of the regime. <laughs> so basically the whole thing is just going on by a gunda process. And since they have the money, they can pay. They can pay gundas, they can pay lawyers, and they can basically pay their way into staying in power. So one of the ex-children told me that when he was growing up in their school, it was just like being in North Korea under Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-un is eating big beefsteaks, he's got wine, he's got Western television, he's got big cars, he's living very nicely, very opulently, and the children were being fed rotten oatmeal, they didn't have soap, they didn't have shoes, they didn't have this, that, and the other. So it's really just like growing up in North Korea. That's what he told me. That was his experience as a child in their system. So the same people who created that system are still being worshipped now. Their pictures are on the altars in ISKCON. So that means that kid has to go and see Kim Jong-un being worshipped <laughs> in ISKCON if he wants to participate in ISKCON. So no thank you. He's not going to participate. So they've disenfranchised the senior devotees, Prabhupada's disciples. They've alienated and disenfranchised the children of the original Prabhupada disciples. And all you have to do is look at pictures of ISKCON temples today, just full of Hindus. And that's what they're catering to. That's what they're doing because that is how they make money and they're able to maintain their opulent life. And they're doing that at the expense of Prabhupada and Prabhupada's society. So that's basically how they hijacked it. And the reason why they hijacked it is pretty obvious because it has created a very opulent, cushy life for a few elite 
individuals in the ISKCON society, or what's left of the ISKCON society, <laughs> what they call the ISKCON society. So ISKCON is no longer ISKCON. Anyway, I hope this helps. Hari Bo.